Yeah, hi, it's Harpreet Singh from Western Singh Law Firm. Today I want to talk about itemized wage statement. So you have already heard about wage statements, so payroll statements. So I want to talk about that, what are the requirements, what should be included in those pay statement, and if you uh, don't provide those pay statement to the employees, what are the consequences for that? So let's move forward. Um, so first, I think uh, if maybe few of the people who have never worked somewhere, mostly they were self-employed, have never had any employees. So wage statement is basically um, a piece of page which uh, on which there is a bunch of numbers which have mentioned obviously rate, uh, number of hours and how much you are paying that particular person uh, to do work as an employee. So you have to provide that calculation uh, to your employees when you are providing uh, the pace, pay stub, um, which, is, which includes of the check you're providing and the statement. And it may or may not be a check. Uh, maybe you are paying them in cash, but still you have to provide your employees with some sort of statement which mentions about those calculations. So uh, let's move forward and look what are the requirements of those statements. So, so these statements have legal requirement. First of all, the, there is a legal requirement that you provide this uh, sort of statement or calculations with a bunch of information in it. And we will, uh, in a moment, we'll look uh, which kind of information you need and uh, so which would constitute compliance with the law. So uh, when we are looking at these requirements, these requirements are very technical. And these requirements come from California Labor Code, specifically from 2 to 6. Uh, so there are like about nine items which needs to be mentioned in your wage statements. So first, which is obvious, who is the employee? So first you need to put the name of the employee and either social security number or some identification of that employee. The main purpose is to identify who you are providing this uh, particular wage. So if there is a dispute about that, so we would be able to identify uh, about these calculation and who this money went to. So name of the employee, social security number, or if you are talking about uh, uh, ITI number, if a person cannot get a social security number or some kind of identification like an employer number. And the second piece of information, which have, uh, I think, uh, a, a lot of litigation on, it's the name of the employer. Because you also know, means in order to resolve a dispute, you need to know who you're fighting with. So a correct name of the employer is important and and also an identification of that employer because there can be many uh, uh, employers uh, if you are talking about uh, like ABC company, there can be many ABC company, which ABC company you're talking about. So you just put the address of the employer An address of the employer can be their headquarters or place you are working at. So because why it becomes more relevant and becomes an issue when we are talking about staffing companies, when you are talking about those temporary service providers uh, who just hire these employees, or, or if we are talking about in terms of farms, your farm contractors who are hiring actually these employees, but they are working for you. So who is the employer in that situation? Uh, if you are talking about farm contractors, so you have to put the name of the employer you are actually working for, not the farm contracting company. But still, if the farm contracting company is, is in that, uh, if you are an employee of that, obviously you just include that. But uh, the employer, the entity you are actually working for should be included as well in that. So, uh, so this is the basic information. I think most litigation happens. Obviously, there is always, uh, not always, I will say, most of the time there's a name of the employee at least on, on those pay stub or itemized waste statement. Uh, but sometimes there is issue about uh, the employer because sometimes uh, it's, it's also becomes important because when you bring a litigation against uh, so-and-so employer, 
um, if there is a corporation mentioned in that wage statement, um, if it's not that corporation, uh, you want to maybe present a claim against an individual officer of that uh, corporation who was actually the employer. Because sometimes people uh, maybe are uh, created some other corporation which they are not using that corporation uh, to do this particular work, but they are, uh, means I will not use a word, funneling the money, uh, but they are paying you through that bank statement. So it will just show that uh, the corporation is paying you itself, but the corporation is not the employer. The business is held by an individual employee. So there comes the issue about that when you have claims uh, filed. So, uh, so the state legislature has already provided these rules who should be on that employer. And obviously, if you have a dispute, you will just uh, obviously argue about that. So next, it's uh, the gross wages. When you are, because obviously, as you know, if you are providing a wage statement, gross wages is really important to know because from there, all the calculation goes on about, we will just look at the deductions and what's the net pay. So obviously gross wages should be there and hourly rate should be mentioned there or a piece rate uh, wage should be mentioned. Piece rate uh, wage, when I talk about that, I'm talking about if there is some flat rate for a particular project. Um, obviously, minimum wage need to be met. But if you talk about um, if a project, especially if I'm talking about a trucking industry or uh, transportation, there are uh, you you just provide a project to your driver and you just make if you. Uh, if you drive my load to a particular location in New York, I will pay you $5,000 and other deduction fuel and other charges would be deducted. So those kind of piece rate meals. And again, piece rate meals, uh, regardless, you have to provide minimum wage because sometimes you see it's too much work probably if you uh, just calculate a number of hours. It's, it's minimum wage is probably more than what you're getting as a piece rate wage. So you have to provide that information, hourly rate, or if you are providing piece rate uh, in terms of unit and, and what's that piece rate. So basically you're providing that uh, information to, to make these calculations. So next thing you have to provide is the deductions. Deductions are important because uh, Obviously, uh, in terms to reach to the net wage, deductions comes into play because uh, when you talk about deduction, if you have seen your payroll statement, deductions include several several charges, where we, which we combinedly called as uh, payroll taxes, which include your unemployment insurance uh, deduction from state and your federal taxes, state taxes, or disability insurance. So all these kind of charges are included in deductions. And there can be other deductions as well. If you have asked your employer to deduct certain amount of wages for your 401k plan, so that would be shown as deductions. Or if there is uh, some other charge like uh, uh, premium payments for your life insurance, or disability insurance, if you have authorized your employer to deduct that. So all those kind of deduction need to be on the wage statement in order to make accurate calculations. And the next is, uh, and the last thing, uh, in terms of calculation, if you can talk about, it's the net wage. After all those calculations, what's the net wage? And all these numbers when I'm talking about, it needs to be accurate. Uh, there is a room means still if you have a violation um, uh, without like having any intent or if there is some clerical errors, it's 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 fine. Law also understands uh, there there can be human errors from payroll company, uh, unintentional errors maybe once here and there. It's fine with the law, but if you talk about and and we will see what would be the consequences if you don't follow that. So the next thing is the pay period. You have to mention 
the pay period from which date to which date you are uh, making the representations about these calculations so if there is dispute in future or even if there is no dispute a, an employee just want to see okay means for number of 10 days i have worked for so much as self evaluation or performance if you can say um, or if there is future dispute obviously means uh, it would be uh, good to have that pay period instead of finding that and i will uh, i think most of the wage statements uh, um, i think you would be getting you would pro, uh, you would see these information but i will talk about in one of the scenarios which which will create a mess about this uh, i have already talked about the employee number and the name because identification is the most important thing you have to do and obviously the next thing is the total number of hours because on on that basis only you are just making those calculation based on your hourly rate what's number of hours then comes your gross wage and then your deductions and then the net wage so let's see the next uh, i think the requirement for the employers and also uh, employees it good to know for you that the employer need to keep these wage statement in their record at least for three years an employee has a legal right to request copies of these wage statement or their complete employee file because that's part of the california labor code um, and the code is very strict on that because the employee uh, has the ownership kind of on this records because it's it's their information and if suppose in future uh, employee have issues with uh, uh, calculations or maybe employee uh, is thinking about uh, that there is some unfairness which happened and just want to review their file so the employee can request it's always good to, to make the request to the employer in writing so within 21 days of the receipt of that request the employer need to provide the employee uh, that whole employee file uh, to the employee and uh, the employer cannot ask for money to provide that uh, other than just the cost which is incurred by the employer to produce basically to just copy that and it would not be much maybe uh, depending obviously means if if you're working at a higher stage you would have more document so it's all about documents copying cost and all those kind of it, it should not be much maybe uh, uh, four or five dollar ten dollar you're talking about so it should not be much so uh, so this is very strict if the employer doesn't provide these statements or these employee record within 21 days then there is a penalty and code is strict about that and the penalty is about 750 dollars so 750 dollars maybe for some employer it's not much but obviously if you have one violation and then if you just keep on violating and the government is very serious about that then you you have at behind the California state's uh, enforcement powers which you don't want to challenge because in that situation they will just keep watch on this because probably you're doing uh, I think on recurring basis these violations and then uh, the government will keep watch and if there is next violation then penalties uh, will goes up or there can be another investigation from labor commissioner's office so so it's really very important for the employers to provide those uh, employee records and the next uh, let's talk about the consequence if suppose there is some violation some violation means if if in wage statement employer name is not correct or employer's address is not there just kind of a technical violation but still it's a violation so the law has some consequence for that so so the in terms of consequences so for the for per employee for per violation it's fifty dollar for your first citation so if suppose on just one wage statement there is incorrection so we are talking about fifty dollars if we are talking about like for all the employees if you have like uh, 20 employees then we are talking about little more money for per violation but just imagine if you have like 20 employees 
and you are doing these violations from last six months. Just count how many pay statement, even if we consider like two pay statement a month, which would be more obviously because there are more, <laughs> more weeks uh, if you just see annually. For example, if you just see like 24 wage statement which are inaccurate and you have 20 employees, then you just do your calculation with $50 and, and it increases, it increases to $100, but there is a limit for that. So the total amount would be $4,000 maximum. So that's the amount of penalties the employer has to give. In addition to that, plus cost and reasonable attorney's fees, which is always more than $4,000. <laughs> Obviously, if um, depending on like uh, how far you have argued with each other, there would be like amounting attorney's fees involved. So, so it becomes serious and, and you have to take it seriously. You should, I think, just look your policies and just see uh, if you have an employee per violation. Sorry, it's $1,000 per employee per violation. Because there are so many numbers so <laughs> so sometimes it get mixed up so these uh, these things become very serious if you're talking about like amount like bunch of uh, wage statement bunch of violations and and obviously bunch of employees then it just keep rising up so so these are all the uh, basic laws about just keeping accurate wage statement and consequences about that. And there is a whole lot of litigation which goes on that. If you're talking about an hourly wage and hour claim from an employee, uh, you will find mostly this cause of action, failure to provide an itemized wage statement. So basically what they are saying that you have made a technical violation probably, or in a situation which uh, I just tried to discuss a few moments ago, so when you're talking about a misclassification of an employee as an independent contractor, in that situation, this issue becomes very significant. Why? Because if a person who you classified as an independent contractor giving 1099 from few years, if we talk about years, there's like many number of months and you're talking about many number of possible wage statements. So in that situation, now you're talking about you have not even given the wage statement. Just forget about any technical violation. You have not even presented any wage statement. If you're not giving it, there can be an, uh, maybe a, a, a statement or maybe a payment of a bill uh, in that situation. Obviously, then you have to look. And if you are just giving them as 1099 independent contractors, uh, you have not put the deductions, which is required. So in that situation, you are talking about whole different, I think, form of issues and violations and penalties. And this issue comes up a lot because now there is, a, because the law is becoming more broader with uh, AB5. Uh, there are some changes with AB5, but still um, for most of the employees who are, in kind of sales environment or maybe in different who doesn't have any exceptions. Uh, even if they have exemptions from AB5, they're still, you have to, you have to qualify your uh, employee or you have to just show uh, he or she is an independent contractor. Otherwise, you have to deal with these issues. And these issues you will just see usually in wage and hour claims. Um, if you, someone is talking about or uh, over over time, so if you have not properly provided overtime, then you have obviously you have messed up your whole calculation, and every wage statement is a violation now. So so just uh, think seriously about that. Evaluate, uh, I think your employment policies, your wage statement, or just at least give a look and and just see if you are meeting all those requirements or not. And for employees, you just uh, make sure. If there is some uh, issue about wage statement, bring up with your employers uh, because it's it's a, a relationship of cooperation and obviously means I I see there are many employers who don't care, then obviously you have to deal with them with law. 
uh, but if I think if you can bring up these issues with your employer uh, and if your employer is fair enough they will correct that and you don't have any calculation issues or other thing there can be issues unintentionally also um, so I think any fair employer reasonable employer will correct that otherwise you have to deal with law means and, and there are severe penalties and attorney's fees attorney's fees is a big part because when you go to wage and hour claim maybe wage and hour claim is about ten thousand dollar and attorney's fees you are talking about twenty thirty forty thousand um, dollar that's a big part and that's a big issue and sometimes people don't know about that when they are just dealing with wage and hour claim so if you have uh, any question about any wage and hour claim uh, so you can send me message or or you can call at 209-213-2280. Uh, so uh, we can have a consultation. And and this is just, just a general legal information. So you should not take any uh, legal action on yourself just based relying on this information. So you should contact a legal professional. Uh, so see you for a next video about employment law topics. And thanks for watching this video. Uh, see you in future. Thank you.